Hey, this is Jeff. Welcome to this edition of After Five, a music, art, and entertainment podcast picking up for my radio show, Left Off. And welcome, everybody, to this edition of After Five. Today I have joining me John Macenti of death metal band Incantation and Chuck Sherwood. Welcome to the show, guys. Hey, what's up? How are you doing? How are you doing? Thank you for having us. Yeah, great to be back. So first of all, I'm sitting here looking at the cover of Decibel Magazine with your pictures on it with the caption, Gods of Death. So congratulations on the cover, and what does it feel like to be a god of death? Uh, omnipresent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're just, it just it's, it's, it's not an easy life, you know? It's really... Takes a lot of work being such a god. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like people pray to you all the time, the uh, whining, the, yeah, you know, I mean, the, the sacrifices. Exactly. But you know, th- there's benefits because you know you, you get to cut in line, no problem. You know, you, you get special treatment. So you know, we'll, we'll take all those great things of being a god. You know, I mean, yeah. somebody has to do it. You figure, let's let it be us. Yeah, so, coupon day, early bird specials. <laughs> <laughs> so it must have been kind of cool, though, for, to actually get on the cover of Decibel Magazine. We all kind of grew up with. We're all reading. We all can't wait to see on the cover. And it was you guys. Yeah. No, yeah. It was great. I mean, it was. A, we were really happy when they, you know, wanted to have us on the cover and do, like, an extensive, um, you know, interview on us. It was definitely a cool, um, cool thing. We're totally appreciative of it, you know. But, and, of course... Having the god gods of death as the um, you know kind of like the headline for the article is also pretty flattering too. You know, definitely wasn't expecting all that. You know, yeah, it's yeah. I mean, uh, all joking aside, like it's it's uh, it's a huge deal, and yeah, uh, much appreciated for having that opportunity and the privilege of being on the cover. It's it's huge. So this year, you guys been pretty busy. I mean, of course, John. Preparing for the Carolina Chainsaw Massacre Fest with you and your wife, Yo-Yo, put, put that on. And you guys are also playing shows and putting out a new album and dealing with all that goes on with that, plus your everyday personal lives. So for both of you, with all this running around and all this stuff going on, does it ever get overwhelming for you at this stage? I would say, I would say yeah, it gets overwhelming at times, but I'm just one of those people I really like to keep busy and um, I don't know, it's just it's always something spinning around, turning, you know, turning the gears in my brain to to want to do or accomplish or whatever. So, yeah, I, I have a habit of kind of putting way too many things on my plate or whatever, you know, but it's I mean, it's been going good. I mean, you know, the uh, Carolina Chainsaw Massacre, you know, went well. It didn't go as well as we were hoping, but it, it definitely, you know, did well on something that we're proud of. And then, yeah, we've just been busy, like, trying to get stuff organized for this album and just did some touring in Europe, which was, uh, you know, Europe and Australia was really awesome. And, um, yeah, I mean, it's just it's, – it's been great. I mean, the um, Incan touring has all been badass. We did South – we did – well, Central America, was it? No, we did South and Central America in May, too, right after the fest and stuff. That That went great. Like everything's been just going really freaking awesome, so it's it's pretty pretty cool to um, you know be doing this for so long and seeing things like getting better and better, especially over the last like five or six years. It's just been like you know progressively getting better, more people interested in what we do. The shows have been getting more and more full each time, so you know it, it, it's pretty damn cool to get to play music and have people give a crap about it. What do you think? You said in these past five or six years, it's been getting more and more people. What do you think attributes to that? It's been a few things. I mean, I think um, getting back with relapse really helped because um, when we were working with uh, Listenable, they just didn't have the, you know, the proper um, distribution and like just just. They just didn't have a good foothold in the U.S. market and stuff, so that definitely was a um, a problem. Which we wanted would relapse really helped us um, kind of get back on track because we were doing well in the states, but we really needed like you know our product 
to be out so people could buy it and like get to know our new stuff or whatever without having to pay a hefty price. Like we were just having problems with them where, you know, we were supposed to have our, our uh, albums and CDs available via um, like, you know, like a U.S. version of it so you could pay a regular price. But instead they were like we were getting charged people were getting charged um you know like import prices for so it was really screwing things up for us you know where our stuff it was just crazy so with relapse we were able to get things kind of back on track besides that our booking agent at uh, continental booking has been doing an amazing job of helping us get exposed to you know a newer younger crowd and at our you know on getting a lot of good support tours we did marduk you know we did dying fetus um, the Devastation on Nation tour with, um, you know, um, Dark Funeral and Belfagor and um, Morbid Angel and um, Watane, you know, we just had a lot of great support tours to kind of, you know, even even though people knew who we were, we just needed to really play in front of people, kind of show them like, you know, the actual live experience or whatever, you know. What What do you think, Chuck? Um, exactly that. I mean, it's uh, bringing the uh, the albums to the people. If it was limited by, you know, label restrictions or whatever the case may be, uh, that was at no fault of our own. But having the right backing as it has been these past five years, it's definitely showing. I mean, you have a fan base that can either generate from one particular era of the discography to another. But now we're finding people that are just like hearing us for the first time on perhaps like sectival divinities. And with that, comes a whole new, fresh, uh, you know, uh, inspired and energetic, you know, fan base. And that spreads even faster, I find. Um, you'll have people that are, you know, traveling to come and see you, and they, they would say, I had no idea who you were, but I, you know, I loved it. And that is, uh, that's huge, too. And that's only been as of in the past, yeah, a few years, I would say. And yeah, I've been, again, definitely a lot of people, you know, that might have heard of us or even never heard of us. And we're just like, holy crap, like, where was I, what, you know, or what, or whatnot, which is really, it's nice to hear that. I mean, of course you want everybody to know who you are, but the fact of the matter is, is that there's always new people getting into the scene or people that just kind of might have put your band on a back burner to some extent, you know, but then once they see you live and you can kind of just kick their butts in that uh, situation, I think it really opens them out up and lets them really understand what the band's all about. So it's been, it's been pretty awesome. And I mean, even the most, uh, the most recent uh, was at the uh, decibel metal and beer festival. Yeah. And, you know, the, the banter that was going around the crowd were like, who are these guys, <laughs> you know, and, but it's great yeah. in, in its own way because after <laughs> the fact they were like, I'm going to go pick that up like mm -hmm. now. And it's, it's cool. You know what I mean? To, to have that kind of immediate reaction of like ignorance to now a supporter now a fan you know and that's that's fantastic i mean i don't care when you you know discovered the the, the project in and of itself it's just yeah. that if you truly enjoy it and you are supporting it as such then of course the numbers grow and yeah that's, uh, albert albert that's after that show was just like came up to me was just like holy crap <laughs> that was amazing he's like that you guys really put on a moment that especially you know and i was just like really I was up there thinking, like, I hope I'm not fucking this up too much. You know? I did the same thing. I was counting in my head. Yeah, like I, I was, I was counting. I was uh, waiting for transitions to come in. Like I was in a different world, you know. And then people are like, "Holy shit, that was great!" And I'm like, "Well, that's nice to hear. Was it really great though? You know, like, kind of I don't know yourself, you know. I mean, I'm happy they liked it, but I was kind of like, "Huh, okay. Well, hey, if you like it, more power to you." I, I after we played, I was kind of like. Yeah, yeah, a little bit, you know, I was like, did it, did it sound all right? You know, and, but I mean, everybody's their own worst critic. So yeah. we were the first ones to be judgmental of ourselves, leaving the stage like, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> so you never know. Yeah. Well, plus you're playing a beer fest. Everybody's drunk and everything anyway. So, you know, <laughs> everybody <laughs> sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we, I think we played a good enough slot. So it was like, people were pretty juiced up but not too juiced up where passed out yet so right. you still had an energetic crowd that's awesome. it wasn't like the I, I drank too much and i'm sleeping crowd <laughs> yeah, yeah that's true it was a good time slot actually yes it was
And, you know, speaking of touring, you know, a lot of shows this year were part of a 30-year anniversary tour, but hasn't the band been around a little bit longer than that? Yeah. Well, our 30th anniversary tour really should have happened in, what, 2019, I guess, but it just it just didn't work out then. And then we want we wanted to put out, you know, the uh, retrospective release around, um, you know, around that 30th anniversary. But that didn't work out. And it wasn't until like the, you know, well, first of all, we had the pandemic, which screwed everything up because then because we were going to try to do it, you know, in 2000, you know, 2000, which, OK, it's 31 years. It's close enough, you know. <laughs> so but then the pandemic came and kind of screwed everything up. And then we released Sect of All Divinities and we had the tour for that. So before you know it, it's what, um, 33, almost 34 years on the 30th year. But we knew that was going to happen because when we did the 25th anniversary tour, it was like, you know, who knows how it was a couple of years. Yeah, after it, was, it was off, too. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's like, you know, I'm at, I'm at a point now where I'm just like, whatever. It's 30 something years, you know, we might as well started the 35 year anniversary tour because <laughs> by the time it happens it'll be yeah it'll be, it might be on time <laughs> <There you go. laughs> well, I was like, plus the 30 year anniversary sounds better than the 33rd year anniversary <laughs> yes exactly you know i mean we were, we were celebrating 30 years that we played not the last three <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll buy it. <laughs> so now you guys recently did that show in Dubai uh, and a few shows down under in Australia. So how did that all go? Oh, well, it was it was great. I mean, it was cool to be able to play a place like Dubai, which you know doesn't really have a lot of metal, but they you know there's a a guy there uh, from was a Metal East uh, Productions out of Dubai that's really trying to you know jumpstart the scene over there and stuff and he's been he's been bringing some bands down there you know there's not a huge amount of bands that they could bring down but they do bring down bands when they can and stuff and um yeah the production people did a really great um you know really great job and everything it really made us feel um at home and stuff and the response of the show was just amazing um you know it was a midweek show, so it wasn't as good as it was going to be, say, on a weekend and stuff. But we still had a lot of people come out, and a lot of people traveled from, like, other countries, like Saudi Arabia to come see us, and um, Serbia, uh, Serbia, I'm sorry, Syria, um, Oman, um, what was it, um, you know, Qatar, um, a bunch of places, you know. So it was really great to be able to, you know, hang out and you know first of all play but then also just hang out and talk to these people from all around the middle east that don't really get that much stuff and were you know diehard fans of the band it was just a really great experience to um you know be able to connect with them and it's like it's just nice to know that no matter where you go in a world like metal heads are, are metal heads you know i mean you know there's always the bullshit of whatever you know stuff that to deal with in their culture that's difficult but that metalhead spirit is like alive and something that is like uh universal you know it's not it doesn't doesn't go with any one race or any one um part of the world or whatever so it's really it is, it's awesome to be able to give people that as far as the australian thing that was um over the top too i mean every time we've been to australia it's improved um each time that we went there and this time was definitely um you know, the best time we've ever been there. The uh, responses at the show were great. I mean, we had awesome turnouts at the shows. Um, you know, just, it was just great to see that the, there was a really great, it was like the old school people came out. A lot of younger kids came out to the show and it was just really inspiring because it's just, there's so much fun to be able to play in front of, you know, uh, a <laughs> front row of the stage with a bunch of young kids being metal as fuck, you know, while you're playing, it's just such a fun um, vibe. It like brings me back to, you know, the uh, late eighties, early nineties with the, uh, you know, denim jackets and, um, you know, just staying in front of the stage the whole time, banging your head, you know? 
And, you know, getting back a little bit to the Dubai show when you were saying a lot of people came in from different countries. You know, a lot of these different countries probably you wouldn't be able to play in because, you know, your content or whatever. So it's kind of nice to have Dubai as a place that's kind of easily located to all these other people that could actually come in to see a metal show without going to jail or some shit, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we had that experience just down in Brazil when we were with Crypta that uh, there was this there was this girl that I met in um, Moscow mm-hmm. when we played there, and that was in 2016, I want to say. So, <laughs> granted, I, I, I didn't really recall her, but uh, she was like, you know, good to see you again, this and that, and I'm thinking, if we didn't meet here... In Brazil, I would never see you again. Yeah, it's cool. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Because, uh, I mean, what is the likelihood of us going back to Russia? All right. That's not happening. Now it's not. Yeah, you know, and like, that's not happening. So, you know, and vice versa, if they were to come over here, that's probably doubtful as well. So for us to meet in that little, you know, way station of being Brazil, that was pretty cool too. You know, it does happen. It's a, yeah. it's a worldwide community, like just like John said, you know, but uh, we're very, uh, we're very devout. And it, yeah, I think in, um, you know, it was, it was cool. It's cool to have a place like Dubai that does shows and yeah, it gives people opportunity. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's difficult for them to get there. I mean, you're getting, you know, somebody that's able to fly in probably or like bust themselves in from a neighboring country to go see see us play or see whatever metal bands play but it's you know they don't get that much stuff so it's like as long as like they're able to get the time off of work and stuff like that i mean it's something where they could kind of save up to and see and and a lot of the people at the show actually like travel to Europe a lot to go to the festival circuits and stuff like that. So they do, they do have like a, you know, a metal scene there. It's like, cause I was asking about that because, you know, obviously, you know, the uh, restrictions from, you know, the Islam religion on some of those countries and stuff. But, um, you know, they were saying that there's a, you know, there's a, a strong underground scene in a lot of places, like, especially like Syria. And they were saying, and, um, mm-hmm. Or oh, was it um, Egypt and stuff like that? It was it's actually a pretty big scene. Like bah- Bahrain has a a metal scene there, you know. So they they do have like the un- an underground scene. It's just really underground. It doesn't really, you know. They, they do shows like in s- some of those countries, but I think they just you know can't do anything super high profile. You know, like having a a uh, Western band come out is more of a problem except for a place like uh, Dubai where they definitely try to be more um, I don't know what the right word is I guess maybe more liberal I guess mm-hmm. uh, there and you know they're Dubai seems like they're more interested in being like a uh, kind of a a touristy place or be like you know have a good uh, western type vibe to you know the Middle East we'll say you know because I was I was haven't been to the Middle East before so I didn't know what to expect. But I was asking him, like, is this like, you know, how it is in other countries in the Middle East? I'm like, no, this is like the, the kind of the propped up version of the Middle East. You know, it's, it's definitely a lot different in other parts you go to. Yeah, definitely a lot more liberal and, and probably was your safest bet there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they were, I was talking, the opening band was from Bahrain. Oh, boy. And they were telling me that they got a, you know, good scene over there. And they're kind of similar to Dubai where it's not like super, um, super strict, you know, mm-hmm. like they're able to have shows and not have problems with it, you know, but, but I did hear that there, you know, some bands that were super high, you know, say really high profile and really anti-religious did have issues with, uh, even Dubai. They were a little concerned about, cause they don't want to like over push it, oh, you know? Right. I also want to make mention that your music was featured in that indie horror film called Death Metal with the band also appearing on stage in the film. So how did that mm. whole experience come about and what was it like to see yourselves in that film? That was uh, enjoyable. Uh, so the, the, the fake band was Abyss Sinister. <laughs> and uh, I remember that uh, Kyle had said that he had uh, talked to the director and uh, I believe the producer as well because he's considered part of the uh 
is he executive? Pro- no, he's not executive co-producer. I think is his title. He was executive producer. He was executive, um, and he helped uh, provide the location, which also was uh, hosting the uh, Hell's Head Bash at the time in Cleveland. And they brought their whole film crew in, and they invited all the actors. To- we had a. Uh, it's funny to watch that movie. It reminds me of After Party Massacre in a sense because it's like all these friends of ours that are, uh, <laughs> you know, essentially doing these small roles in order to forward the story. And then the actor, like actual actors, take over. And uh, I had this idea of like, you know, us doing an acting scene. I said, but let's just be dicks, you know, like let's just be absolutely brutal to these people. And uh, yeah, that's the, the the scene that still stands. So it was. Uh, you know, uh, John, Kyle, and, and myself, um, we acted a small scene uh, in the beginning of the film. And it, it really just kind of sets the stage for them as being this band that, uh, you know, had troubled a troubled tour and was trying to remedy that by summoning demons. And yeah. I, I think and you I, can see that was, film. Go ahead. With that? Go ahead. I was going to say, I, I know... I felt super uncomfortable doing the uh, <laughs> acting scenes, you know, in that one, but I was was able to get out a couple lines or whatever before mm-hmm. getting really shy about it, you know. But Chuck did great. Chuck and Kyle did great at it. <laughs> so it was fun, and like, and even the uh, the actors themselves, they were like, "We apologize for grabbing these instruments because we don't know what the heck we're doing." And I said, "Well, I apologize for acting because I don't know what the hell I'm doing." <laughs> <laughs> So it, it was like a, a colliding of worlds, but it actually did make for a funny sequence. And, and it's kind of cool, too, because they did win some of these little indie awards for it. And and you could watch it for free. I didn't know this. I just found this out yesterday. It's like you could watch it for free on Tubi, and I have it. So I know what I'm doing today. I'm going to be looking for all. I'm going to be looking for Chuck. I'm going to be looking for John being uncomfortable now. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's enjoyable, and and uh, I mean, do you know spread the word of it as well? I mean, we've been uh, trying to push it as much as humanly possible when it comes to the internet, but you know how the internet is. So you know, even word of mouth, for example, will probably help. You know, it's well, a good fun watch. You know, on a you know the night you're drinking and stuff, want to watch kind of a a funny cheesy kind of horror movie. It's really a good a good um, a fun watch, and I and I happen to really like like. A comedy horror so it's definitely um you know in that ballpark it was it really enjoy it makes it really enjoyable and now speaking of films it was said that a documentary on the band was in the works but then something kind of happened or something do you think that this is still going to be picked back up eventually uh well yeah well it was supposed to be a documentary on me but then obviously connected to the band and stuff um but that like it was. I thought it was going good until it wasn't going good anymore. And I don't really know exactly what happened, but it was just, um, you know, it, it just seemed like it. Maybe I, I'm thinking the project was a little bit more of a monstrosity than maybe originally planned. I'm not exactly sure, but mm-hmm. um, I just know that it, it's put on hold now. And I was told that, you know, he might possibly want to take the footage that he already has and kind of release that as like a short documentary i don't really know what um how that could work properly but it's you know i mean i i think that you know i mean it'd be nice to you know finish up the documentary or or do it properly in the future sometime but it's not really like a um a top priority to say and then we also have um you know uh, our friend um jason um from Canada, he's he's been, he worked with our he was our PR guy for a little while back in the 2000 like teens or whatever, and um, he's he's also working on a book on incantation as well. Oh wow! He's done numerous interviews. I, I don't know if he interviewed Chuck yet, but I know he did um, Kyle and myself a lot in the last like it's it's been like a slow thing, but probably around seven years you've been doing like on and off like little interviews here and there with him to try to put something together as a book so there's a couple of things in the works but these are all like kind of back burner things right like whenever right. Happen, they happen you know like I, I like to live in the moment you know and be be metal and stuff not i mean it's fun to think about the past and all this you know talk about the older stuff but 
you know, at the same time, like, you know, we have a new album coming out and that's more fun than, you know, doing book interviews, you know? <laughs> well, with this book, you know, the longer it takes, the more shit you keep doing. This can go on forever. It'd be one humongous book at the end. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe it'd be an encyclopedia. <laughs> <laughs> well, like the, the, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, like a phone book or a uh, Lord, yeah. Lord of the Rings or something. Oh, yeah. in, yeah. like, yeah. like a fucking tome, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. so your new album, Unholy Deification, did I say that correctly? Yes, you did. Okay. Now, is there any conceptual theme or anything to this album? Indeed. Um, so I actually have something prepared. Um, it is a, it is a concept album. Um, and it's uh, an apotheosis, essentially, uh, in multiple stages, song by song, uh, from ritual magic. So the Roman numerals that you see at the uh, the ends of the songs are each of the uh, chapters. And we felt uh, the music demanded that the flow in which you will hear it is how we wanted to present it. But for those willing to dig deeper, you can follow it along in its sequential order and uh, hear it in a completely different way. Um, each one of the stages involves um, this one, in, you know, one particular person that no longer wants to subsist on belief and ethics and faith and wants something uh, greater than himself to actually supersede, uh, you know, organic life and become an actual deity that is, you know, uh, has graven images and feared, worshipped and sacrificed to and becoming a, a dominant force of, of all life and death. Um, and being in like stark contrast to like other religions, he would be like, you know, evil incarnate. And throughout the course of it, you're going to find everything from summoning a spectral guide to banishments, words of power, appeasing elemental forces, ritual circles, altars, chalices, uh, and, you know, finding male and female qualities in order to produce a homunculus, uh, which is like the actual vessel in which this, you know, new God is being formed and, all along the way, you have uh, a journey of the uh, material that we created for it. So, so a lot of thought went into this. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah, uh, an, an awful lot. I mean, even down to the point where things that are in quotations are actual dialogue between the uh, the alkalite and the entities in which he's summoned. So it took over a year to you know, research, edit, revise, you know, rewrite. And as chapters would, you know, develop and or fall off, then you have to compensate for that to make one cohesive beginning, middle and end. And uh, yeah, it, it was an it was an undertaking, but it was worth it because uh, I had done something similar in the past with Dirges of Elysium. The song Elysium was to be a six chaptered concept. And now this time I wanted it to be more grand. So uh, it took on the uh, the entire album. And I was going to ask a little bit about that, too. Actually, that was going to be my next question, because I, just going by, you know, your album titles and songs, I had no idea what the Roman numerals represented at the end of each thing. And, and now we know. And all the thought that went into it. <laughs> yeah, because the, the singles in particular, like the first single is the very first chapter, and you'll see this, you know, this gentleman who no longer wants to live in a, in a normal corporeal life. So he summons the spectral deity and by sealing this concordat, this pact that he makes with him by having like a, a bloodletting, they create a double helix, which is the, you know, building blocks of life. So that is the literal inception in which that one DNA strand becomes the deity that you see on the cover. Mm. That's kind of cool. So John, you must be happy to have Chuck in the band so he could do all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. We just keep him there for that. It's otherwise it's, <laughs> terrible dealing with them but he comes with these great concepts <laughs> a burden in every way <laughs> no no john i believe it was you who was quoted as saying rage gives focus now was there a lot of rage put into this album if so what are y'all angry about well that's actually i think chuck's quote ah, like i know I, it was somebody <laughs> I, it says that i said it but i think it's chuck so yeah yeah <laughs> it, yeah, I mean, it, it's that uh, all of the times when you're on stage and somebody goes like, man, you look really pissed off. I'm like, I am. <laughs> Why, though? <laughs> because this is the very outlet in which we've uh, you know, been drawn to this style of music. 
death metal is not happy. Death metal is not fun. <laughs> death metal is not like flipping over backwards and going to playgrounds. It's brutal. It's relentless. It, it used to strive itself to be grosser than anybody else. It used to strive itself to be more blasphemous than anybody else. And that kind of rage gives us the very focus to put forth aggressive and powerful music that we can deliver to those. And the reaction is so positive in their rage that it just makes us play even harder. And yeah, most and, definitely. And it's so difficult to be like pissed and grumpy after you play. Cause you're just like, ah, you got everything. Yeah. Out of it. You know? <laughs> Sometimes you're playing you're like, I better find something to be pissed off about. Cause I'm, I'm running out. I'm like, we're raging so hard. I'm blowing through all, all this negative energy. And, and like, as people, we're not, angry people in any way shape or form but that and because i think that if we didn't have death metal in our lives we'd be very very miserable <laughs> yeah that's fair to say well it's just it's just fun i mean for us to watch you you know on stage and see you up there all mean and then you come off stage you're all like happy guys like i think you're gonna do backflips on the playground when you get off <laughs> yes yeah and, and it's like you know that that uh elation moment you know what i mean that everything's all you know you just spent it all and yes. now it's you know time to have a good time you know and uh yeah i, I would say that we're primarily happy people but the things that we write are not <laughs> now, now you guys also had some pretty great guests on this album so tell us a little bit about them and what their contributions were to this album um well basically it's uh what was it uh What's the last song on the album, Chuck, that they circle? Oh, uh, circle. Yeah. Yeah, circle. Um, yeah, basically, we when we were coming up with the uh, lyric, you know, um, patterns for circle, you know, I, we thought about it'd be a good idea to have kind of a chanty part in the middle. It just seemed like it worked with the, the riffs and stuff. So, um, you know, when doing it, you know, just kind of, just, I don't know, I just kind of thought about, I was, talking with Jeff about some stuff, uh, you know, some stuff. And we was just like, oh, what the hell? I see if Jeff wants to do it, you know, because obviously it'd be great to have somebody that is, um, you know, so iconic in the scene and somebody that was really a, an important part of all of us in the bands, like um, reason for doing it, you know, because I mean, possess is pretty much like, like we'll say brick one of like death metal and stuff. So, it was really awesome to have his contribution to it. And then, you know, on top of that, you know, Henry Vegian, which was the uh, main, uh, the guitar player vocalist for Revenant when I used to play in that band. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was kind of really cool. He, he happens to live like an hour from me now. So it was like, you know, I told him, well, why don't you come out sometime and you could also be a part of this. And uh, for me, it's just a, a personally a good thing because, you know, Revenant was the band that gave me my start, gave me my focus as far as, you know, finding myself and everything so I could do uh, incantation. So I always have a lot of um, appreciation and respect for him. So to have him on the album was special for me. And then we had also Dan Vladivon, you know, from Morbid Angel. He's been helping us out on bass when Chuck can't tour and stuff. And he's been doing a great job. And when we were putting this together, it was just like, Huh, well, Dan's right here. Let's fucking do some vocals, you know? I think he might have even recorded the vocals, if I remember, like, in our touring van in Europe, you know? He was just, like, he was just, like, yelling the vocals. So it's it kind of cool, you know? Just tried to, you know, wanted to have uh, fun with it, you know? I mean, it's not something where, you know, there's, you know, like a, a major duet or something like that. And it's not even trying to really over exploit anything or whatnot. It was really the reason for doing it was more personal and just, um, you know, to have something that our, our uh, buds and our friends and our influences are, uh, you know, have them part of it is a great little uh, circle around, you know, for us. And it's kind of fun for the listener, too. I mean, it's like you said, it's nothing huge. You know, let's put a big solo on Dan or on Jeff or anything. Yeah. Probably if people didn't know they were guests on the album, they wouldn't even know they were there, I think, to tell you the truth. Yeah, that's true. I think so. I mean, if you know, you could pick out, you know, right. the vocals. But if you don't know, yeah, you might think it's just, you know, just part of a song, which... I guess it's supposed to be just part of the song. So it it's not supposed to be, you know, like I said, a, a major mm -hmm. duet or anything like that. You know, it wasn't what we were really looking for, you know? It's just their presence that's there that makes it all impactful for us. Yeah. 
you know, and it, it's not it's not being showcased and it's not exploiting it or anything. It's mm-hmm. just it, it adds the element to the song that it was necessary. I and mean, it, I think it, it, sounds, it sounds good. good. Yeah, it sounds good, which is great because you know that's the end of the you know end of the day you want the part to sound good and it sounded fucking great. And also in in that chanting part too, uh, Luke is also doing vocals for that too. It just um, you know, and I think that's the only vocal yeah it's only vocals he did on the album so yeah it's cool though that he did that and you did some too didn't you know that part yeah i did i did yeah. vocals on too yeah so yeah, yeah. i guess it's all of you six of us yeah, <laughs> yeah. so we like we talked a, a touch just a little bit on the album art you know before anyone even listens to an album the first thing they see is the cover art so so tell us a little bit more about it tell us a little bit more about the art for this album and how much of a part you guys have in the creation process of it all so i've been essentially working uh in tandem with uh ellen cantor for the past four albums and you know originally i think i gave him like maybe like two portions of a concept at the time for dirges of elysium and he turned it over in one mock-up that was what ended up becoming the cover it was like lightning and because of that i think we got over ambitious and started giving him more and more um elements of the songs to make it more of like a collaged or more abstract and the the process became longer but it's a testament to his um not just his craft and his fortitude, but also his willingness to like work with us and his uh, patience, really. Because, you know, if you come back with a mock-up and you're doing two and three and four at a time and then final, you know, having a finalized product, this time around was a lot easier. Um, I presented him with the one all-encompassing uh, element that is what this concept is, is this man becoming a god. So what does this god look like? You know, well, it's going to pull from all the different resources that it did throughout its journey. And it's claws and hooves and tails and wings and all the elements that, you know, we would always associate when it comes to like demons or deities. And you see all life, you know, having to pass through it in order to reach oblivion. And it is the all encompassing faith that nobody can, you know, deter from and it's almost like in a in a non-linear time frame to where that that deity has always existed and it's not quite clear for the very reason that what would you you know what what could you draw that would show a god i mean you have so many different race creeds cultures religions you know all over the world that how would you encompass all of it well that's why it looks as it's such you know and i think he did a fantastic job yeah, yeah, it came out. yeah, absolutely, and um, yeah, it's it fits the album cover itself. Just looking at it, kind of, I mean, I see incantation when I see it. It's like you said, maybe because you've been working with him through throughout the years, um, you gotta kind of get that special rapport with them. So after that many years, they kind of know what you're going for and your thoughts, and it really comes through in the art. And I think it's really great for this album. Yeah, I mean, Ellen has been said on occasion. Well, I think I got pretty much a you know a good time frame you know block that I can start working on this. Unleash the Chuck, and <laughs> I would come in and just like like bump like you know two years worth of lyrical content and descriptions and pictures and oh, it must have been absolutely overwhelming for the poor guy. But um, <laughs> this time around, I just kept it short and sweet and said like, this is it. This is going to be the creature, and just add these elements, and we should be good to go. And you know, I think that uh, there was a couple of edits that had to be done, um, but it's the, you know, the nature of the artist is to find a particular flow. Um, the color scheme was actually presented by Kyle, um, whereas, you know, all of the, you know, uh, detailing and the like was just a, a matter of um, editing. And, yeah, he really outdid himself. I think it's a fantastic piece. And now for you guys, a lot of people kind of think of you as, well, the gods of underground death, even though you aren't as underground nowadays, but you have, you know, these loyal fans that have been following your band for over 33 years. <laughs> so so yeah. what 
does that kind of feel like for you guys? I mean, you know, all these years you kind of been known, but and now you're getting really known. I think we mentioned about this a little bit earlier. So, so what's it like for you guys personally? What's it feel like? Like, holy shit, people know who we are now. Is it, is it feel great or do you feel like, oh, I kind of wish we were still in our safe little underground bunker? I, I wouldn't say that it's like necessarily changing our outlook per mm -hmm. se. Uh, I mean, we always will be who we always have been really. Um, how we carry ourselves is, uh, is the same as it ever will, uh, will be. Uh, the fan base is like I was mentioning earlier is, is uh, becoming younger. And with that, you know, comes uh subsequent, uh, you know, um, like a, I don't know, just a, it's like a larger and faster, you know, rise to the top, I guess is probably the way to say it. But that sounds like egotistical and stupid, but like you're getting known more. But I mean, for ourselves, like when we go to these shows, we will reconnect with people uh, multiple times. I mean, look at look at us, for example. Like I remember talking to you on a street when uh, <laughs> I think Profane Nexus came out, you know, and. Right. Uh, and and it's like you know here we are you know uh and i wouldn't say that you're any different of ourselves you know during that time frame mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know the people's acceptance of it is humbling and it's and it's fantastic but it doesn't uh i don't think it affects personally speaking i don't think it affects anything really uh we just do what we like to do yeah it's kind of a thing where we do yeah that's the best way to say it. we we're gonna do what we're gonna do either way you're right and the fact that people are, you know, connecting with it more now, say, than maybe, I don't know, 10 years ago or something like that, um, is it's just the way it goes. But it's not something that it's not by design, we'll say, on our end. You know, our end, it's by design to do what we do and express ourselves our way. And for us, I think no matter how um, well we end up doing, which, you know, only time will tell, um, we're always going to have an underground, um, you know, outlook. Like we look at it in an underground way. Right. Maybe it's it's close to like say um, I don't know a way like bolt thrower looks at stuff. Is they're like stubborn? They're in their old school way. They do they do things their own. You know, it was just like their way of doing it. And it's like who cares about time? Who cares about whatever? We're just going to do it our way. And that's kind of the way we are. We just do our do it our way and it's like you know if people like it that's great and if they don't like it it's fine it's death metal so they're not really supposed to like it that much it's like the, the whole style and stuff was always kind of a niche to some mm -hmm. to, to a large extent or um, all a full extent maybe so it's um it's all good you know either way i mean of course it's nice to have people really like the band but it's not the um no focus or nothing like that i would say you know right well Recently, you know, I'm doing some of my research. I came across like this AI music composing site. Now, as AI applications keep moving forward, as far as the metal industry goes, what are your thoughts on AI in both compositions as well as cover arts? And do you think it will impact the metal music industry at all, or if at all? If it, if and when it impacts, it will not be a benefit. No. because the the ability to create ai artwork has become a uh, like cookie cutter mm -hmm. it became very popular everybody started doing it and all of a sudden you got 30 bands all with the same exact kind of style of ai artwork and as that develops yeah there'll be more differences between those 30 but it does not mean that there's any it, there's nothing into it. it. It's like people that rely solely on uh, technology in order to create albums. Now you don't even have to do anything. You don't even need motor skills. You just kind of punch it all in and voila. Like, what in the world is that? <laughs> that can't yeah. be good. <laughs> it, it reminds me of uh, the AI artwork now. I mean, it looks great, you know, but it's like you start to realize like, oh, they're using the same stuff. You know, you could dig. It's pulling from the same area from you know everybody or, or whatever so it all looks the same you don't have that individuality of the artist in that art and it reminds me of back in the days of when um you know photoshop got popular 
and everyone used Photoshop to make those bubble letters, you know, those bevel letters may look 3D on. And it was like, it was really cool when you learn how to do it and stuff. And then at a certain point, like every band flyer you had, had like these 3D bubble letters on it, you know, and that's kind of the same thing that's happening with the AI art. I mean, I mean, uh, I don't know if it's, yeah, it's, going to probably improve and who knows what's going to happen in the future with it. But I think it's just a bad thing because relating it to the music part of it, it's like if I have to ask AI to write me a song and I get say like, write me the best death metal song ever or something like that. It's like anybody else could do the same thing. What's going to happen. Everyone's going to have it write The best death metal song. And, and the, the, another thing that's just screwed up about it is like, one of the most fun parts of being in a band is creating songs and writing songs. It's like, why would I want a computer to take that away from me and like lose my individual, um, ex- you know, thought expression of, um, you know, of uh, being creative and stuff. I don't know. To me, it's just not of an interest, you know? I mean, I guess if somebody's main goal is just to be popular and, um, you know, write generic stuff that, you know, probably everyone's going to like, then I guess that's, that's their prerogative, but not, I'm, I like to be, uh, it sounds cheesy, but I like, I like the art of creating music and playing music. It's not just, you know, it's not like being in a band. And, oh yeah, I'm cool. Cause I'm in a band. No, I, I like, I enjoy doing it. Right. Well, you know, I feel the same way as you do. Of course, I'm an older person. So of course I would feel that way. But recently I even asked a question or mentioned something like, you know, hey, I could do math in my head. And an adult put on there, why bother do math in your head when you could just ask Google? So this is kind of like the generation that's coming up now. Why bother writing music when you could just ask Google? Our generation may be different, but... I don't know about this new generation coming up, John. I'm getting a little nervous. <laughs> Although I would yeah. say of all the genres <laughs> out there for AI to write for, I think death metal would be the hardest to get anything good from AI. So I think of everything out there, death metal might be the safest. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Who knows? I mean, uh, you know, every single art medium that exists actually started at one particular point with a hands-on approach and then was replaced by technology. Mm-hmm. You know, people went out and painted, like, you know, still life and other things in order to, you know, emulate the world around them by creating a painting. You know, then photography comes along and it ruins it because you could just, you know, take a picture of it. So what do you do? Painting becomes abstract. Painting becomes more bizarre. And now you have people spending millions of dollars for a banana tape to a wall. Like, it just, it, do you know what I mean? Like, it just, it doesn't make any sense, you know? So you know, this, this same exact thing will happen now that people will relinquish all of their ability and their devotion to learning a particular instrument or creating a band with their bandmates. And it'll all be replaced with a computer. You know, uh, it, it was Millie Vanilli's career was ruined because they lip synced. Who cares about lip syncing anymore? No I one. know. I know. Those guys so, wanted to kill themselves you know, over that. So, I know. <laughs> but as you can see, it's like everything is degrading because there's absolutely no ability that's actually being – it's it's not being nurtured. It, you're finding a replacement for it, the easier, the faster, the the, the who cares, just use Google. Mm-hmm. You know, people don't even know how to do, uh, c- uh, do cursive handwriting mm-hmm. anymore. They don't even teach it in schools because it's irrelevant. Right. You know, and it, that was it's, another it's just, thing. I put the same thing, Chuck, and they said nobody uses that anymore. So what's the point on learning it? Yeah, but, but ex- exercising your brain is important right. and, and utilizing and understanding it. I mean, especially at a young age, I mean, you need to figure out, you know, where where you benefit, you know, in this whole thing of life. And part of it is learning how your brain works and, you know, learning learning these things. So, I, yeah, the, the more the more the computer ends up becoming people's brains – it's probably going to just numb things out. But if, if you, everybody's so numb because of their, you know, the computer could do all the work for them, then, you know, they'll enjoy the numb, the numb music that comes from AI because they're not, you know, they don't need that um, complex simulation of, you know, anything. Cause it's just going to, you know, ask the computer to do everything. I think at a certain point that's going to happen though, there's going to be some sort of, device connected to, to you maybe it'd just be the phone who knows but it'll basically anything you want 
you just say what you want or what you're thinking and it'll give you the answer to everything without even you don't even have to type it in the Google anymore. You just tell it to Google, you know, so you don't even get the practice of like uh, typing it stuff. in. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, it's going to turn into like Wally. Remember that? Oh. Everybody, you know, everybody's like, you know, just completely obese and floating on chairs. And I'm like, that's that's the future. Here we go. Oh, gosh. Well, on that happy note, Incantation <laughs> has a new album coming out August 25th called Unholy Deification off of Relapse Records. There's still some copies you can grab and you can also check out Incantation on their social medias for more links. And John and Chuck, as always, thank you for stopping by and I wish you guys and the band all the best. Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Likewise, thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's good to see you again. You too. Yes.